shrunk, or the celiac ganglia right there, the lesser is going to send its axons down to synapse in the superior mesenteric and aorticorenal ganglia. And then the least will send its axons down to synapse in the aorticorenal ganglia. This is a simplification, and in fact there's quite a bit of transfer between each of these, but for the purpose of this course we'll treat it as though the greater is projecting to the celiac, the lesser to the superior mesenteric and aortical renal, and the least to the aortical renal ganglia alone. Now, once the presynaptic sympathetics have made it to the prevertebral ganglia, celiac, superior mesenteric, aortical renal, and inferior mesenteric, we have them synapse, and then this is the easy part. If you know the branches of the vessels, that's how they get where they're going. So they can follow the right gastric, the splenic, or the common hepatic, and whatever organ they're trying to get to, they will follow the branches of the artery that supplies it. So be sure you know the branches of the arteries going to all, each organ, because that is also the route that pre or sorry postsynaptic sympathetics take to get to the organs that they innervate. Now jumping down a little bit, you'll notice we haven't really touched on the inferior mesenteric, intermesenteric plexus, and superior and inferior hypogastric plexi. These receive their innervation from the lumbar and sacral levels of the paravertebral ganglia. One thing to remember is that the intermedial lateral cell columns where all the presynaptic sympathetic cell bodies are, yet we've got paravertebral ganglia stretching all the way up and down the body. That's because many of these axons enter the chain and descend before leaving. So as they do so, we've got the lumbar levels, L1 down to L5, and then sacral levels, forming the lumbar and sacral splanchnics. And one thing about these splanchnic nerves is that they do not really bundle together like the other ones did. Greater, lesser, and least tend to form tight little bundles more than a single nerve. The lumbar and sacral splanchnics stay fairly separate all their way in, and they run straight to the aorta to synapse in the various pre- vertebral ganglia that are nearby. So they make it to whatever ganglia are nearby. And synapse there. Because of that, we aren't going to ask you specifically to cite which lumbar sacral splanchnic nerve goes to which individual ganglia. Just that they tend to go to all over the place. The ones that are going to the gonads will synapse in the intramesenteric ganglia, send their postsynaptic sympathetics out following those vessels. Likewise, lumbar splanchnics are going to send not just the gonadal branches, but also to the inferior mesenteric, supplying the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and superior rectal portions of the gut tube. And then here, the superior hypogastric plexus and inferior hypogastric plexus, we have sympathetic cells synapse in both of those plexi, and they can indeed follow the arteries that are nearby, but we're going to defer following those for just a minute until we get to the pelvis itself. Before we do that, let's discuss the parasympathetic innervation of the abdomen and thorax. To follow the branching patterns of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system is quite a bit easier because the parasympathetics only come from two places. Here we have the vagus nerve coming from the brainstem. We have a right and left vagus nerve. And then in the sacral region of the spinal cord we have the S2, 3, and 4 spinal cord segments giving parasympathetics to the hindgut and all pelvic viscera. So the vagus nerves, right and left vagus nerve, travel down the neck and arrive at the cardiopulmonary plexus to innervate the lungs, the bronchi, and the heart. And parasympathetic innervation is going to slow down the heart, constrict the blood vessels, the coronary vessels, 
and also will be um, op closing down the bronchi. The sympathetic nervous system is going to do the opposite. It'll speed up the heart, open up the bronchi, and cause the heart to contract more strongly. If I misspoke earlier, keep in mind sympathetics are going to respond in such a way that your heart speeds up, your lungs allow you to breathe faster. Parasympathetics will do the opposite, closing down the bronchi and slowing the heart down. After the vagus nerves have passed through the cardiopulmonary plexus, they do a little something interesting. They travel on the esophagus, turn into the right and left vagal trunks. As these travel down the esophagus, they will travel on the anterior surface of the stomach as the anterior vagal trunk, whereas the posterior vagal trunk will be on the posterior aspect of the esophagus and out of the line here. Parasympathetics to the stomach on the anterior trunk will synapse on the wall of the viscera and that postsynaptic parasympathetic neuron will be very short traveling to the organ that it's in the wall of. So very quickly you'll have those nerves going to their target. Now one quick thing about the anterior vagal trunk is it also passes across the lesser omentum to innervate parts of the gallbladder and liver. That's it for the anterior vagal trunk. More importantly, the posterior vagal trunk jumps off the esophagus and winds up in the celiac ganglion and plexus. Because it's parasympathetic, it's postsynaptic. Parasympathetic activity will not synapse in the prevertebral ganglia, but pass right through it along the vessels to get to the viscera that it innervates. And because it's parasympathetic, it will synapse in the wall of the viscera, and the very short postsynaptic parasympathetic axon will innervate that. The vagus nerve innervates all the branches of the celiac artery, all the organs supplied by it via the celiac plexus. Likewise, all the branches of the superior mesenteric plexus and on down through the aortic renal as well. Now, below there, in the intermesenteric plexus, inferior mesenteric plexus, superior and inferior hypogastric plexus, we don't really have any more vagal input. Instead, the S, 2, 3, and 4 parasympathetics travel with the anterior rami of the sacral nerves, pass out the anterior sacral foramina, and then peel off those nerves. And as they do that, they are then referred to as pelvic splanchnic nerves. These are very low in the abdomen and in fact run directly into the inferior hypogastric plexus on each side. From here they need to innervate all the organs up into the intermesenteric plexus so those presynaptic parasympathetics will ascend travel through those vessels to the testes and ovary, synapse in their wall, and the short parasympathetic postsynaptic will go from the wall of the organ to the immediate tissue right after that. Likewise, all the branches to the inferior mesenteric and hindgut organs. And here, some of these axons that ascend to reach, reach the superior hypogastric plexus will travel along the blood vessels to get to other organs but the interesting thing that happens here is that these inferior mesenteric plexi, instead of necessarily going up to the arteries and following them to their targets, will sometimes go directly to the nearby organs. And what organs are those? Well, in the lower part of the pelvis we have the rectum, we've got the uterus, And in the male, we've got the prostate, ductus deferens, and seminal vesicles. And in both sexes, we have the urinary bladder. 
And what these parasympathetics from the inferior hypogastric plexus will do is just form a nice long plexus, continuing the inferior mesenteric, and just run along the surface of each of these organs all the way through. Now a little bit earlier we said that we would revisit the postsynaptic sympathetics for the superior and inferior hypogastric plexus. And the reason for that is that they, these sacral splanchnics, presynaptic sympathetics, will jump onto the inferior hypogastric plexus, synapse with cell bodies scattered in there, and then join those plexi going to the rectum, then the uterus, then the bladder, in women and in men, rectum to prostate to urinary bladder. These plexi are surprisingly simply named as the rectal, uterovaginal, prostatic, and vesical plexi. And they are containing presynaptic parasympathetics that synapse in the wall of those individual organs and the very short postsynaptics do the same thing they always have go in and innervate those organs those same plexi are extensions of the inferior hypogastric plexus also contain postsynaptic sympathetic axons that are innervating those same organs as always in the body, sympathetics are going to be innervating organs in such a way that they respond to a fight or flight situation. So it's going to decrease pressure on the bladder. It's going to stop the prostate from secreting. Likewise, any action of the uterus will decrease and action of the rectum will decrease. So that sympathetics will cue you to move blood to the periphery so you can run away from a threat or fight. Parasympathetics will increase activity in all these organs so that you're able to rest digest, defecate, etc. Now that's essentially the autonomic nervous system of the abdomen, pelvis, and thorax in a nutshell. There are a little bit more detailed pieces that fit in here, but if you can understand this, you've got most of the information at hand. The last piece of information I'd like to let you know is that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves also serve as a highway for the uh, for, pardon me, for the ves uh, visceral sensory axons to get back to the brain. We can go through all of these in detail or we can just remember painful stimuli from the thorax and abdomen are going to follow sympathetic innervation back to the spinal cord and wind up in the T1 to L2 spinal cord whereas thorax and abdomen non-pain stimuli reflexive signals back to the brain to let them know how the heart, lungs, abdominal organs are doing will follow parasympathetics. So either the vagus nerve or back to the S2, 3, and 4 spinal cord levels in the event that you've got any in, uh, innervation or sensory information coming from the testicles, ovaries, inferior or hindgut organs, and then any organs supplied by the superior and inferior hypogastric plexus. There's only one exception to this whole scheme and that's in the pelvis and that is organs that are covered by peritoneum partially will have their superior portions follow that same route. Sympathetics for pain fibers, parasympathetics for non-pain fibers. If we're looking at organs below the peritoneum, so the rectum and the lower half of the sigmoid colon, the lower half of the uterus, the lower half of the urinary bladder, and all the male internal genital organs, these organs are below the pelvic pain line. And in this case, it's actually very simple. Pain and non-pain fibers follow parasympathetics back to reach S2, 3, and 4. That's the only exception to the rule, and thankfully it's an exception that makes things a little bit easier. That ends our summary of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system with a quick discussion of visceral, sensory, and the pathways that those take to get back to the central nervous system.